Over the course of these last two and a half years, doctors and experts have told me they've seen an unprecedented assault on free and open scientific discourse with potentially deadly consequences. Today and tomorrow, I'll be joining the Censorship of Science Conference at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, DC. Tonight, you'll be watching the public part of the conference, where we'll be hearing from three major thought leaders that I've previously had on the show. Former Harvard epidemiologist, Dr. Martin Koldorf, Stanford Professor of Medicine, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, and Hoover Institution Senior Fellow, Dr. Scott Atlas. All three are founding fellows at Hillsdale College's Academy of Science and Freedom. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Beyond infection, and those issues uh, include uh, politicization of science, the scientific process has been damaged, and uh, the free exchange of ideas, frankly, is under threat in the United States. To combat that, uh, we need to do more than just fret about it. And so, uh, Dr. Arne, in his wisdom, uh, has initiated this new academy uh, for science and freedom. I am Scott Atlas, one of the uh, co-founding fellows, along with my colleagues uh, Martin Koldorf and Jay Bhattacharya, who I'm sure everyone here knows as well. It's a great honor to be working uh, as a group with everyone here. And uh, we have a particular, uh, I have the particular pleasure of introducing uh, Martin Koldorf tonight as our guest speaker. He is someone who doesn't need an introduction, but it's such a great introduction, I'm going to give it. <laughs> Martin uh, was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, and for over a decade, uh, one of the world experts on statistical analyses of uh, spread of diseases and surveillance. Uh, he was uh, a consultant and on certain committees of the CDC and the FDA, uh, and has helped with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, and as a member on the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee of the FDA. Uh, Martin has developed statistical and epidemiological methods for disease surveillance uh, and uh, novel statistical analyses uh, for uh, indicating not just early detection of disease outbreaks, but also uh, drug and vaccine safety surveillance, which is of some relevance these days. Uh, Martin uh, has developed uh, statistical analyses that are used today uh, in the CDC uh, and in places like New York City and other health departments to monitor COVID-19. He is truly an authority on all of the things that we think uh, he might know, but he is more than that. Martin is uh, really uh, one of the most courageous people of all the colleagues that I have come to know during this uh, pandemic, I almost said during this fiasco. Um, Martin, uh, people may remember that I uh, received a, a sort of a censure by a group of professors at Stanford University Medical School. And Martin Koldorf was the only scientist in the country who had the guts to go public and write a letter to Stanford, not only in defense of what I said, but specifically challenging all the signatories to a debate on the issues. Needless to say, zero accepted that challenge to debate Martin Koldorf. So uh, it is really a great pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Martin as a colleague in this new institute, uh, as a courageous and honest individual, and as a friend. Martin? Uh, thank you, Scott, and uh, for the 
uh, to the Kirby Center and to Hustler College for hosting us uh, both today and uh, also uh, for uh, this initiative of the Academy uh, for Science and Freedom. I think uh, uh, science is broken and we need to build new institutions that can help uh, save science uh, uh, for, for the long term. Um, uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, statistical and economical methods, but I'm sorry to disappoint you, I'm not going to show you a single mathematical formula today. So uh, I'm, instead I'm going to talk about censoring in science. And it's sort of a personal experience, and as I, t as I tell you this story, you have to realize that there are other scientists who have had more or harsher censoring on them than, than I have had, but I'll tell you my story. Uh, and then uh, you can sort of imagine how other people have, have had similar stories. So if you go back in history a little bit, two years, to March of 2020, when we first uh, heard the news about this new disease outbreak in Wuhan, um, I was very afraid for, for about uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Because as soon as this pandemic uh, hit Italy and Iran, which were the two countries outside of China who got it first, I realized that we are going to get this. This is going to spread throughout the whole world. There's absolutely no way that we can stop it. Uh, it's so contagious. It spreads without us knowing about it. Uh, so that was very clear. And of course, I'm a father. I have three children. So as all parents, I'm much more concerned about my kids than about myself. So I wanted to know, are they at risk? So I looked at the, the Wuhan data, uh, which was the, sort of the only good data available then, and I saw this risk factor that uh, while, of course, anybody could get the disease, uh, be infected, there was more than a thousand-fold difference between the young and the old. And I thought, well, this is sort of important information because it really determines what strategy we should use for this disease. Uh, I was no longer uh, concerned about my kids, they would do fine. I was sort of in the mid, mid group. And uh, of course, for older people, we sh should be very concerned and make sure that uh, they are protected. But I tried to sort of publish this sort of simple calculations, but it was uh, difficult. I wasn't able to do that in the US. And maybe it's that I only have 20 years of experience as an infectious disease epidemiologist. Maybe you need 30 or 40 years, I'm not sure. Or maybe it's because I was only a professor at Harvard University and maybe they wanted a more prestigious uh, <laughs> place. But I'm not sure why, but I was unable to do so. Um, so eventually I, I posted what I wrote on LinkedIn because I can post whatever I want there after, after three or four weeks of trying. Uh, but because I, I figured that, okay, nobody wants to hear this, but it's important actually that for historical purposes that, that it's clear that there were people already back then who knew these things and knew what sort of was the appropriate approach of protecting the old but not shutting down society for children and so on. So I put it there just to have it as a historical document. And, uh, uh, I'm a native of Sweden, so I was reading the Swedish uh, approach, which was a little bit different. And, uh, but I was a little bit afraid because there was a debate in Sweden, so I was sort of afraid that the public health authorities there who, took, uh, uh, <coughs> who didn't close schools, for example, that they would buckle under the pressure. So I decided, well, I should write in the Swedish. So I, I published in uh, uh, three op-eds in the two major daily newspapers there. There was no problem at all getting published in Sweden. Um, and I figured that, well, if Sweden can hold out until the summer, then everybody will see that that was the right approach, and then everybody will follow Swedish approach, and good. Uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Eventually, I published it in English also in a, a sort of obscure uh, a UK uh, uh, online magazine. Uh, so if we jump forward a little bit, it was sort of frustrating uh, with the difficulty of, of getting one's voice heard. And uh, I tried many different things. I, uh, I actually I managed to get into CNN, uh, write an op-ed for CNN Español, uh, because I know how to write Spanish. Uh, the English version, English, CNN English didn't want it, but uh, I, I was so. 
but we were trying to think how can we sort of educate the journalist or how can we get out this message and Scott was very heroically saying things, but they were always dismissing him. He's just one person, and he's a radiologist, and blah, 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 blah. And other people were sort of dismissed because they were one person, or they were not. There was always something wrong with them. And so there was silence. So we figured, OK, if the three of us, me and Dr. Jay Bharacharya, who is in the back here, and uh, Dr. Sunatra Gupta, who is, the, in my view, the preeminent infectious disease technologist in the world, we got together. And we wrote the Grant Barrington Declaration, a one-page thing, where we argued for better focus protection of older, high-risk people, uh, at the same time as we let children and young adults live uh, uh, near normal lives, uh, so as to minimize the collateral public health damage from these lockdowns and other measures. Uh, well, uh, that was, uh, we got some attention and it got enormously attacked. And every time I read uh, an article about it in whatever uh, newspaper attacking it, they would always have the link to the declaration that says, yes. Because then at least some of those reading it would actually click on it and actually read it. And uh, by now, I think about 935,000 people have, uh, have signed this uh, declaration, which uh, makes us very humble and thankful. Uh, the reaction from the director of NIH, Francis Collins, was uh, he wrote to Tony, that is uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, look at this, uh, uh, the proposal from these three fringe epidemiologists, uh, uh, you have two of these fringe epidemiologists here in the room today, who met with Secretary Asa, who is Secretary of Health, uh, Health and Human Services, seems to get attention there needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of its premises. I don't see anything. Is it underway? Uh, so what do you think uh, Dr. Fauci responded? I am passing below a piece from Wired that debunks this theory. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this... Uh, uh, journalist who is probably a, a very fine young man, uh, but uh, it's a little bit surprising that Dr. Fauci uses him as the authority on epidemiology. Uh, he's a journalist uh, who typically covers the climate, food, and biodiversity for Wired magazine. Uh, but maybe he knows more than Dr. Fauci. I, I don't know about these matters. It wouldn't kind of surprise me, but. Uh, Here's another email a few days later, also from uh, uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, he thought that uh, we were similar to the, those people who denied AIDS uh, a couple of uh, decades ago, which is kind of strange because uh, the purpose of the Great Barrington Declaration was to argue for better focus protection of those that are at highest risk. That was a major part of it. So why would we do that if we don't believe COVID is real? So I, I don't quite get the logic, but uh, uh, that's exactly what he wrote. So uh, there was sort of an organized uh, uh, campaign against the Great Barrington Declaration with various sort of strange accusations uh, that it was let it rip, which is the opposite. Uh, we were uh, thought uh, that we were like uh, exorcism uh, eugenics, uh, clowns, anti-vaxxers, that we did financial gains, even though the opposite is true. We were accused of threatening others, which none of us have done. Uh, Trumpian libertarian coke funded pseudoscientists and that we received a free lunch when we were at, in Great Barrington uh, uh, writing this declaration. And one of these is actually true. There, are, there, are, there is such a thing as a free lunch, actually. We did get, actually, we get two free lunches there. So <laughs> that was kind of nice. That was good food. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah. Uh, so the focus of this talk is uh, how censoring is, both direct censoring and sort of uh, other forms of it. So when the Great Barrington Declaration came up, uh, at the very beginning, it comes up top in the search engine of Google, but then suddenly it wasn't there. Instead, what was there was those who criticized it. And uh, other search engines had it at the top, but not Google. And there was some, uh, uh, there was some uh, sort of discussion on that. And then eventually, a week or so later, it came back up. Uh, so I guess 
but Google always denied that it did anything. Uh, there were some issues with CDC, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So I'm going to just tell you what was censored. Uh, so here was CDC in April 2021. So I was serving on a, a committee, a working group for vaccine safety of the COVID vaccines. And at one point, uh, CDC decided to make a pause on the J&J &J vaccine because of some uh, issues of blood clots. And those blood clots was in uh, young women under the age of 50. But they decided to pause the vaccine for all age groups. So I th it was very clear from the data. And one of the things that I spent many years on is to figure out how to, as quickly as possible, find out whether there is a problem with adverse reactions or not, using what's called sequential analysis of a weekly looking at data. And it was very clear to me that there was a concern for women under 50, yes but there were absolutely no evidence, and there was actually evidence that there was no concern for those over 50. And those are the ones who really need these vaccines. The purpose is not for the, uh, the, the, the young women or even young men. That wasn't the primary uh, beneficiary of this vaccine. And the J&J &J vaccine is sort of important because it's a one dose, so it's, used, it's good to, to, to reach uh, uh, hard to reach people, like people in rural areas or homeless people where it's hard to get the second dose. So it's a, sort of important that. So I, this, uh, uh, after I sort of decided to, uh, they weren't quite interested in my views on the matter. So I wrote a thing in, uh, in The Hill, uh, arguing against passing this vaccine for older adults. And then they removed me from the committee. And four days later, they, they, lifted the pause, but then the damage was kind of made because it already got a bad reputation. And uh, even this was during the height of the second wave. So, uh, so those who didn't get it, that uh, some of those people died. Uh, so I guess I'm probably the only uh, person who's been fired by CDC for being too pro-vaccine. Uh, in, uh, also in, in the spring of 2020, I wrote uh, on Twitter, uh, somebody was asking, do you think that uh, uh, young people should get vaccinated and what about those who have had COVID already? So I said, no, thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking that nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for older high-risk people and their caretakers, not those with prior natural infection or for children. So to me, that's sort of just basic uh, epidemiology, nothing strange with that. But uh, uh, Twitter has some, uh, some people who have, who, who I guess they, they consider themselves to be expert in this area uh, and they didn't like it. So they uh, censored it uh, so that nobody could uh, uh, share it or apply it or like it, uh, which basically means that pretty much nobody will find it. Uh, later on, they, they locked me out for, I think, about three weeks or so because I tweeted about masks, saying that by claiming that masks are a good protection, some older people will sort of believe that and they will go and do things and uh, uh, get infected thinking that it protects them when it doesn't. And uh, that's not so good, so they might die because of this misinformation about the masks. But uh, I guess uh, that uh, made, took, uh, for three weeks I had no access to uh, Twitter because of this tweet. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I asked, uh, uh, there was an article uh, published by Brownstone Institute by Roberto Strongman, who is an associate professor of black studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And here was a very interesting uh, historical expose of how masks has been, sort of been used historically, uh, for example, to silence slaves. And uh, he talked about uh, uh, Anastasia, who is a Brazilian saint, as, as a former slave. Uh, and uh, that was not popular of Twitter, so that was also censored. Uh, Facebook, they took down the Great Barrington Declaration page for a week. No explanation. Um, the offending post was that we argued that 
with the vaccines, which at that time had just come out, we should prioritize giving it to the older, high-risk people. And that's what caused Facebook to close, uh, close it down. And there was sort of some protest against it, and therefore they pick it back up again uh, after a week. Uh, but uh, that was the Facebook censoring. We had YouTube. Uh, we did a roundtable uh, in April with uh, Governor uh, uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida. It was me and uh, uh, Dr. Scott Atlas, Dr. Jay Bracharya, and Dr. Snetha Gupta. And we talked, for example, about the fact that uh, children don't need to have masks. Um, we argued against vaccine passports, which sort of there was some rumbling starting about vaccine passports. Then we sort of thought, it, let's try to uh, argue against that from the very beginning before it sort of takes off. Well, uh, so that was removed by YouTube, which is uh, owned by Google. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft, they also censored. This was an article, uh, uh, this, was, this was an interview I did with uh, Epoch Times. and. Uh, uh, on the dangers of vaccine mandates. Now, they are a little bit nice, I guess, because they, they only you can see this post, so I could still read my post. <laughs> but nobody else could, so at least they didn't remove it from me, so uh, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, this was another one. Uh, I actually didn't write anything. I just uh, reposted uh, a, a, a LinkedIn post by a guy from Iceland, and what he did, he just uh, cited what the Icelandic chief epidemiologist had said, which is sort of the equivalent of the CDC director in the US. So this is the official uh, public health authority in Iceland, uh, but that was censored. Um, here another one, uh, here they were a little bit harsher because not even I was allowed to read this tweet, they removed it completely. I was arguing that uh, since the people who have recovered from COVID, they are the ones who have the best immunity, better than those who are vaccinated. So they are the ones who are least likely to spread it to others. So hospitals should hire nurses like that or doctors like that and use them for the most frail, oldest patients at the uh, geriatric wards or the ICUs, because they're the least likely to infect these patients. Uh, instead, the hospitals was firing them. But uh, LinkedIn did not enjoy that post. Here's another one. We, together with uh, Dr. Bharacharya, we wrote a, a Newsweek article about how Fauci fooled America with uh, the various things about public health. And uh, LinkedIn took that away also. But uh, Microsoft News, they actually republished it. So one arm of Microsoft is censoring this article because LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft, but another part of Microsoft is actually republishing it. So I shouldn't be too, I guess, upset with Microsoft here, but it's a little bit, uh, so I guess they are sort of, uh, maybe they should just sort of skip it and just sense of themselves, I guess, or something like that. Uh, here's another one that Microsoft uh, or LinkedIn didn't like. I sort of, during the AIDS pandemic, we blamed the sick, we stigmatized gays, we did fear mongering, we ignored the poor, slow with treatments, and NIAID was uh, headed by you know who. And during the COVID pandemic, blame the sick, stigmatize unvaccinated, fear mongering, lockdowns harm the poor the most, slow with treatments, and NIAID is uh, directed by you know who. Uh, so when will we ever learn? And hopefully one day we will learn. Uh, later on, uh, LinkedIn actually uh, closed down my, uh, uh, my account. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Tucker at Brownstone, he then wrote an article about it, which then got tweeted. So I never asked to be reinstated, but they did it automatically. So I think somebody at LinkedIn read this, what Jeffrey wrote, and sort of reversed the decision. So uh, this was the last post before suspension. By firing staff with national immunity after COVID recovery, hospitals got rid of those least likely to infect others. I think this is sort of... Uh, uh, an epidemiological fact, 
but that was the that was the the tweet that got me in trouble. So uh, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, they have permanently suspended many accounts, including uh, scientists. And I have continued to speak up, but I'm being, I have self-censored myself because these are important channels of communication, so I don't want to be removed, so I'm careful with what I say. And for a while I was thinking, well, I don't really want to do that because I should be able to tell what I want and maybe I should just forget about Twitter and LinkedIn. And I talked to a, a dear friend of mine who is uh, also on the faculty at, uh, at Harvard and her family uh, comes from Slovakia and uh, her family was very active against the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. Uh, her grandfather was like one of the leading dissidents there. And she so told me, no, 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 no. You can't just walk away. You have to use whatever they allow you to use. And then you just have to be careful how far you can go so you can keep doing it. Because uh, otherwise you let them win. So she convinced me sort of to, to okay, I need to continue uh, using these, uh, uh, these venues for communication. But uh, censoring, it, it leads to self-censoring and also it leads to self-censoring of people who don't are victims of this censoring because they see that somebody else is censored. Okay, I don't want to be suspended. So I better be careful with what I say. And of course, that's the purpose of authoritarians and the purpose of these things. And sometimes why they sort of kind of randomly select who they censor and what they censor because they want people to be uncertain about what they can and cannot say. Um, but there are things that are ways to fight censoring. I think one is through exposure using alternative platforms, but we cannot only use that. We also have to use the ones that reach the most people. And then uh, some, uh, some jujitsu maybe can be used. Uh, so for example, when uh, Robert Malone was censored, was uh, removed from LinkedIn, other people were sort of complaining about it and saying that it's important that scientists uh, can have debates. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise uh, it leads to bad public health. And uh, so he was removed from LinkedIn. And so I wrote this Twitter thing and I actually did a screenshot this morning. And if you can see there on the right, they are sort of suggesting other people I should follow. They think I should follow LinkedIn, which I'm not doing. They also think I should follow Robert Malone, which I would be delighted to do. Uh, the only problem is that uh, Twitter has suspended his account also but they still want to recommend that I should follow him, so at least that's nice. And you notice that, <laughs> you notice that they remove his bio when you click on his thing, but on the advertisements for his account, the bio is still intact. Uh, so. Uh, the alternative platforms, and I have, uh, I sometimes post on Getter, Gab, Parler, and Speaks. Uh, and I've never been censored there. There's also True Social, which is a new, uh, new platform. So I think it's important to use that, but I think we also need to use the, uh, the existing ones. Um, we can also try to make a little bit fun of people. So once I wrote an op-ed uh, 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 in The Hill, and I didn't feel I should just, maybe if I posted on Twitter, they would censor me, so I said, well, Twitter doesn't allow me to uh, vaccine scientists to fully discuss vaccines, but you can find out it on these other accounts. Uh, if earlier this week, uh, I said, having been censored by Twitter, I must be careful what I write about masks. And then I said, if you do surgery, please wear a surgical mask. It'll protect patients. And uh, I think that's, uh, nobody can argue with that, no? Do you, do you agree that surgeons should wear a mask when they, perform surgery? You do? Okay, good. So we're all in agreement and nobody can say that I said something that uh, was inappropriate. So uh, it has been really stunning to be a scientist during these last two years. Uh, it's kind of been absurd. Uh, we have an NIH director Collins and and I idea that Fauci thinking that you promote science by silencing scientists through published takedowns. It's pretty absurd. 
You have a geneticist and a virologist thinking they know epidemiology better than epidemiologists at Oxford, Harvard, and Stanford, and calling them instead fringe epidemiologists. Uh, we do lockdowns to protect young, low-risk members of the laptop class instead, instead of focusing protection on older, high-risk people. Uh, this mistake led to many deaths, and many unnecessary deaths. Um, we have people pretending to care for the global poor who favor lockdowns that has caused more harm to the poor people around the world than anything other than war and slavery. That's sort of be astonishing and absurd in my view. Uh, people have been accusing working class people who oppose these devastating lockdowns as being right wing extremists. They're just the one who have taken the biggest brunt of these lockdowns and they have lived the, the experience of it. Uh, we had scientists sign, uh, signing in Lancet, uh, a famous medical journal, publishing a petition questioning national immunity after COVID recovery, something that we have known about for almost two and a half thousand years since uh, the Athenian plague in 430 BC. It's, uh, uh, it's not surprising that uh, national immunity is strong after COVID and that is better than the, the uh, vaccine immunity. We would be very surprised if it was anything else. Uh, we had a CDC director who believed that face masks provide better protection against COVID than vaccines. And then another CDC director who questions natural immunity after recovery. Uh, we fire people with natural immunity after COVID recovery, even though they are less, least likely to spread COVID to others. Uh, CDC was firing me uh, as a pro-vaccine, for, for being too pro-vaccine. Uh, big tech censoring apologies to get the pandemic right while boosting those who got it wrong as COVID experts. Sometimes people sort of said, these are the COVID experts and there's people like uh, who, uh, who actually are not even, uh, even uh, uh, who, who don't understand infectious disease epidemiology and public health at all. And then we have zero COVID and I won't talk about that one. So. Uh, so what are the alternatives? Well, we have debates instead of censoring and slander. Uh, Scott mentioned that I uh, offered to debate any of these, uh, was it 98 or so, uh, Stanford faculty members who wrote this letter criticizing him, and uh, that invitation is still open. If you know any of them, let them know that I'm happy to debate them, either here or somewhere else. Uh, we should have had discussion how better to protect high-risk older people. We should have much more discussion about all these uh, lockdown harms, the collateral public health damage from these, uh, uh, because public health is not just one disease, it's multiple diseases, it's not just short term, it's long term. So uh, uh, those are basic principles of public health that we have to, to follow, and we didn't during this pandemic. And we have to trust public with honest information, uh, otherwise they're never gonna trust public health and science, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, there's a reason that people don't, there's a good reason why people don't trust public health and science. And I think the Academy of Science and uh, Freedom is, one aim is to sort of restore it so that we deserve that trust again. Um, so uh, those were my uh, remarks uh, from the last two years. And I'd like now to invite up to the podium my colleagues, Dr. Scott Atlas, uh, Dr. Jay Barasharya and to moderate uh, a Q&A session here, uh, Jan Jeljek from Epoch Times. So uh, we'll jump right in. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with these uh, three American thought leaders, genuine thought leaders. Um, and we're actually going to do this as an audience Q&A mostly. So I'll, I'll just get us started here. And so, you know, as uh, Dr. Koldorf mentioned, there were, you know, there's a lot of alternatives to absurdities that are that, that were offered. And we've also discussed a bit, um, certainly um, in the Epoch Times and in discussions I've had with, with all three of you, um, the, the cost, this collateral damage of the lockdowns. And I've learned recently that in the UK at least, um, there were a lot of counter indications like, that the government had information 
that explained why not to do lockdowns, I guess. And the question that I have is, um, did this sort of thing exist in the US and it was just either ignored or, or, or just sort of thrown out? So there was a paper in 2006 by Don Henderson, who is a famous uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. Uh, who, he was instrumental in uh, the eradication of smallpox. Uh, and which laid out very clearly that lockdowns are not the way to go. And uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so I think most countries had this sort of pandemic plan, so what to do, and they were all protect those who were most vulnerable and try to have uh, a society function normally. So, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Tucker wrote a very good article just recently about the uh, Brownstone Institute about uh, this uh, Don Henderson and what he said in that uh, paper from 2006. It if I may add, I mean, this is something I don't think the public understands, that the, this is not news that lockdowns don't work and shouldn't be done and are extraordinarily harmful. The standard literature on pandemic management before this pandemic was that lockdowns should not be used because they don't work and they're extraordinarily harmful. And the key paper that Martin is talking about was really accepted. This was a, uh, a complete change in the accepted management of a pandemic, what was done. Do we have a mic going around? And let's do a question from the audience. Uh, right over here, first hand. So, uh, Dr. Polo, thank you for your remarks. And the whole time I'm listening to you talk about the way that you've been censored, and all of you have been censored, the question is why? What is it that drove what we've seen over the last two years? Was it greed? Was it partisanship? Was it fear? Was it ignorance? What explains the way that we have seen not just our government react, but governments around the world and big tech and pharma, all this stuff? Why? Oh, I can start. Um, because there, there, it, it, this is always the most challenging question. I get asked this all the time, why? The answer to why is always very difficult. But in this case, um, I tend to think that there was a confluence of different interests, a confluence of different motivations, rather than this idea that there was one major motivation to do this. And what I saw in the White House uh, gives me that basis, uh, because what I saw was a combination of gross incompetence, tremendous hubris uh, by people who were protecting their own status and positions at all costs, uh, people with bureaucratic uh, sort of motivations, that's my phrase really, which is not the same as the free exchange of ideas and debating like in typical science pre, uh, before this. Of course, there is a very complex web of funding science that one of, this is one of the things that we want to expose and then fix if we can. Uh, where there are uh, funding streams coming from people who are, have a massive power, not just over the funding of the research, but of, over everyone's career doing the research. And so university professors who are assistant professors are not going to really feel very comfortable speaking out against the NIH when the NIH is the, ter the determining factor for their own career and then big pharma and everything. So uh, the second part of it, though, is that there, I, I think we cannot underestimate the fear. And I'm talking about the fear from COVID, even in the people who are making policy. Fear uh, is a very powerful distractor from rational thinking. Uh, and uh, when there is pressure in a situation, I think we all know this in our own personal lives, your, your true nature comes out, your true character comes out. And this was a highly pressurized environment, of course, the biggest healthcare crisis in a century uh, during an election year, which was another motivation that I don't think we can ignore, the political side. So when you have people who are personally afraid and are motivated by extraneous things, uh, it, it's a very, very bad mix, uh, particularly when they are intimidated by people who have their own personal names on the proscribed policy, which was the lockdowns. And so uh, there's no easy answer to why, in my view, 
there's a tremendous amount of corruption, uh, and I mean moral corruption, not just financial, because the universities, I'll, I'll give you an example, Stanford University receives over $500 million a year in NIH funding. There are some schools that receive over a billion dollars a year in NIH funding. What do you think the likelihood is that those recipients of that money can speak freely? So th there's a lot of motivations. I could go on and on, but I, but I won't because there's, uh, first of all, I'm going to let Jay answer, but also because there is no real short answer to the question. So, so I, I don't disagree with anything Scott just said. I think all of that is true. But let me just add a couple of notes to it. So, so, so uh, in particular about the emails that you saw, the absolutely shocking emails you saw from Francis Collins and Tony Fauci and, and, and then Tony Fauci about me, Martin, and Sunetra Gupta. Uh, uh, one of the motivations for that was a motivation to create a, a consensus within the public, that, that a, a, an illusion of consensus within the public that, that there was no scientific dissent against lockdowns. The, the reason why the, the Great Barrington Declaration, they reacted that way, because uh, you know, the idea is, I, mean, I love them, but they're like ancient. I mean, Martin told you, like, you know, we, these are not, the, the idea of protecting the vulnerable, I bet you everyone in the audience had that idea during the pandemic, right? Uh, I mean, I saw several people in the audience who, like very brave people who, who like spoke up around this. But the fact that we were from Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford, I mean, I never cared before about coming from Stanford, I'll tell you, before the pandemic. Um, but from Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford, and we got this viral, viral attention, was a problem for this group. It posed a political problem for them because they wanted to tell the public that there was no dissent. And so they had to destroy us. They had to do a devastating takedown. It was a political problem they were solving. Uh, motivated by some of the things that Scott was saying, right? So I think, um, so I think that, that's, the, that's the immediate context for why they, they did what they did. Um, the, the other thing, I, I, so I want to I want to I want to be as charitable as I can be. I think there, uh, in science, the norm is we we we, frankly, science is, science is just another way for fighting with each other in a structured way. I mean, it's it's like it's really fun. Like you 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 know, I have an idea, Vinay Prasad has an idea. We like fight with each other, and then there's a data. There's some 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 like experiment, and Vinay turns out to be right. I'm like, oh damn, Vinay, you got right this time. Um, I mean, that's, that's what science is. is, is. That's, that, that's the warp and move of science. It's like a discussion among people who are, we're all equally struggling with a difficult thing. We don't know the answer. That's, that's the fun of science, right? It has to have that, that kind of norm of a fun discussion with each other um, at, where, where we take each other in good faith. The norm in public health is a little different, right? In public health, if I, as a professor in a school of medicine, get up and say, smoking is good for you. I, I've, I've committed a sin, right? The, the, the scientific literature is completely convincing that smoking is terrible for you. I should not ever get up and say smoking is good for you. I shouldn't even like hint at it. Frankly, joking about it right now is probably going to get me in trouble. Um, so uh, I That's going to be an excerpt on YouTube. Oh, God. Please no. Um, I violated a norm, a real, true norm, a good norm, right? Because I, sh I have a responsibility because I, I act in public health of not crossing that line and, and misrepresenting what's in the scientific literature. Uh, that's, a, that's a true norm in public health. So public health doesn't actually encourage complete free discussion of ideas. I, I mean, legitimately doesn't. But the ethical basis for that norm is that there's a scientific consensus and when you have a novel disease, when you have a, 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 a situation where there's a whole lot of scientific uh, I ignorance, because we just, we just don't know about a whole, you know, how does the disease tra uh, transmit, who's really most, who's, what's, the, what's the, the risk of dying if you get the disease, how best to treat it, you know, so on and so forth. Um, well, you don't, have, you don't have that moral basis. Scientists need to be able to talk freely with each other about these things before you can apply the public health norm morally. And what happened was that the folks that, that, that Martin showed you, they applied the public health norm before the scientific discussion had actually been done, before the consensus had happened. And it was, it was an immoral act because they, they misapplied a legitimate norm in public health to scientific free, free discussion. Can I add something to that? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree a little bit. A lot of the stuff was known in the spring of 2020. That's true. 
And uh, you know, the first person that came out with uh, saying that the targeted protection was uh, John Ioannidis, to my knowledge, who's an epidemiologist at Stanford. Uh, and he was met with a backlash. And in March, I wrote a paper uh, on calling for targeted protection and stating some facts about who was at risk, because this was already known. There was a body of literature in March and April of 2020. And when I wrote my paper uh, in March of 2020, asking for targeted protection, I sent it to the Wall Street Journal. And this, I'm naming them because I think a lot of people think, oh, there's some kind of a left-wing media cabal. No, it, it really was much more pervasive than that. My, re, uh, my rejection from the Wall Street Journal said, oh, we're already publishing all this stuff on, on targeted protection. And so uh, people, because people ask me, why did the first paper you wrote go into the Washington Times? And I put it in the Washington Times because it was rejected from the Wall Street Journal and it was urgent that this stuff was laid out, that the risk to it uh, was known in a very uh, targeted group of people, that we need to protect those people, that it's very harmful to do the lockdowns, uh, et cetera. And so there was a, an enormous amount of information known from studies all over the world. It was known in the, by the end of spring 2020 that we must open the schools. Known, it was proven, it was not arguable that children had an extremely low risk if they were healthy, that most children did not spread significantly the disease, and that there was enormous harm for closing schools. That was known in the spring of 2020. And when you said that, you were vilified, and as Martin articulated here, it was pointed out that you were dangerous, and that's how the lockdowns uh, were, in, were accepted by the public, is that there were, there were two things done. One was everyone who was calling for ending the lockdowns was called dangerous uh, because they were somehow therefore calling for what Martin said, let it rip, herd immunity strategy, no protection, which was a lie. And the second reason was they were claiming anyone who was against the lockdown was prioritizing the economy over lives. Yet there was a multiple decades of literature showing that severe economic downturns killed people. So the answer of ending the lockdowns for saving the economy was because it was lives versus lives. So the, everyone on this stage uh, was vilified to varying extent and demonize as if you were dangerous. And that is why, in my view, the public bought into this, even though it defied all logic. Because when I speak, as these guys do all over the country, everyone in the audience says, that's exactly what we thought when I go through all the data. Because it's simple logic that you knew who was at risk, you do everything you can to protect them, and you don't destroy the people who did not have a significant risk. Now I'm really glad I didn't censor him since I just learned something from him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a super quick follow-up. Um, there seems, it seems to be pervasive that there's, you know, whenever, well, in many important issues like this one, these straw men are created and attacked. And so how do you, how do you counter that, especially when they're amplified to such a great degree? Well, I mean, countering a straw man argument uh, it happens when I was raising my kids because that was our typical dinner conversation. Uh, but, you know, honestly, the solution to all of this stuff, the number one solution to me is stopping the censorship and having transparency of information. You need to think critically. When someone makes a straw man discussion, it's easy to sort it out if you have the information. You cannot, in fact, be, there's no such thing as critical thinking without hearing uh, things that differ. If you only hear one viewpoint, by definition, there's no possibility. Let me give you an example of this. So, so they're saying that we wanted to let the virus rip. Uh, that's a lie. We never wanted to let the virus rip. We wanted focused protection of the old. Um, the Washington Post, every single time they published a, an article with, with, uh, with uh, talking about the Great Barrington Declaration, had, uh, would have a quote from Fauci saying, uh, that this, the strategy was nonsense and that, uh, that, that uh, we, we wanted to let the virus rip. They never asked me to reply to that. They would just, as boilerplate put, let the virus rip. Um, it seems like journalists have a responsibility to try to get the story, at least the other side of the story. I mean, they can put Fauci's side, but let me answer. Yeah, I, just one quick observation and then a question. 
So I think that the, just even the term, uh, the fight, the fight, the, the, the war against the virus and the fight, I think from the very beginning there was an analog to war, to a war situation rather than to managing an emergency. And, you know, we all know what happens in war and, you know, everybody's, you know, striving for consensus. You cannot uh, question anything. And I think uh, I'm coming from a country that had a lot of wars. I was born in Israel. And I, I think that that was an analogy that can explain the mentality and also many of the things that you talked about. Uh, what I wanted to ask, though, is, you know, the base, the infrastructure of science is, are the universities. And... Uh, one of the things that disturbs me is how universities behaved, not only in terms of uh, what scientists uh, expressed, what opinion scientists expressed or didn't express, but rather that, than how they managed themselves and their students. And to, to, to a large degree, universities were maybe the most extreme manifestation of all of these bad policies. They, they actually went to remote studies for, for the longest time possible, other than a few exceptions. Uh, they are now mandating uh, boosters to the lowest risk population from the disease and the highest risk from side effects, even for people that were recovered, 30 days later they are mandated to be vaccinated. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm personally, I'm asking myself very tough questions at home. And my, one of my conjectures is that universities are not managed anymore by academics and by scientists. They are managed by lawyers uh, that just say, hey, that's the CDC guidelines without, uh, th that's how it operates. So I, I wonder what you, your perspective on that is. I mean, so like a, a couple of notes on this. So the uh, university sent, the, they call them kids, they probably shouldn't call them kids, y our young adults home um, in spring of 2020. One of the big problems of focus protection is multi-generational homes. Right? You have older people living together with young people. We created multi-generational homes out of whole cloth by sending all of our, all of our, our university kids home. Um, I, call them, I keep calling them kids. I've, I've, people always tell me, like, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, but, but, the, but I completely agree with you. The, 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 the policies of the university have followed have nothing to do with science. Uh, what, the, what they, the, the, it's, it's a form of groupthink. Like each university is copying all the other universities. They're not referring to science to justify their actions. And they're, they're, the key thing is they want to make sure that no one dies of COVID in the university. It's fine if they die of COVID outside. If they die, it's fine if they kill themselves. It's fine if, they, if, if all kinds of bad things happen to their education. They failed in their mission. And, it's, and it's, not, it's, the, it's the top universities that have failed in their mission. The educational mission, the research mission, the, the commitment we have to the, the young adults in our charge, we have failed in all of those missions. I can add one quick thing, which is uh, people don't know this because it's been scrubbed from the internet, but October 2020, the CDC posted a paper on, the damage, on their policies about schools. I, I was in Washington in the White House at the time. And the CDC said, quote, it is unethical to require testing of students if they don't want to be tested, unquote. Now, that it doesn't even go toward forcing vaccinations to healthy people, young people who do not have a significant risk for serious illness, an experimental vaccine. But they even have forced testing even though the CDC itself in October 2020 said it was unethical. The point is we have had a breakdown of the ethical leadership of young people and a, a moral breakdown in the United States, not just by closing schools, but by forcing vaccines that are experimental, that have known side effects on young people who are healthy and have no, no significant risk of a serious illness. If, as a society, we're going to claim we need to vaccinate children to use them as shields for adults, that is a complete break in the moral contract that we have as human beings to our children. You are the shields for your children. Your children are not meant to be shields for adults.
gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor. So I'll make a quite a, a brief observation and a question. The brief observation is that I'm an economist and I look at you and you're all surprised because maybe for the first time or for a rare time, one of the precise scientists, sciences suddenly the, the mental is taken and we see how politicized this. If you talk to economists, sociologists, uh, literature department, everything else has been cleared of any alternative thought, of any alternative thinking, of anything that doesn't follow the party line long ago. So, you know, you're surprised because, because of the nature of your work, you've been shielded from this complete, uh, I don't know what to call it, you know, uh, Monoculture. destruction. And I'm also from Eastern Europe, so I spent the first part of my life on the similar system, so I'm particularly <clears throat> aggravated that these things start to look a little familiar. The question, though, that I have for you is, we all understand what was the situation here in 2020, the political context, how the whole bureaucracy, the whole monopolies, they were all against certain politician and certain group and, and everything would work in unison. So my question is, how these lockdowns happen around the world? In a sense, every country is an interesting separate case. Did they have a similar political structures? Did they have the, sem the similar uh, censoring? How, I know that Sweden had a little bit different, different, but you know, for example, let me reveal it, I'm originally from Bulgaria. So these little stupid Eastern European countries, they were all saluting EU and doing whatever they were told to do, pretending that they have local experts, which they didn't have any. So a lot of damage was done to these much weaker economies in the name of uh, life and all this. So do you have any views of how different countries, because of their institutional frameworks and their political politics, maybe was not so dictatorial, maybe was not so political, maybe they did it better than, than us. Thank you. So why don't you talk about Sweden? Well, yeah, why don't you talk about that? Well, Sweden was very different, I think. And it was a huge contrast to see it living here, but still following the news in Sweden. And every time I thought, well, it's completely crazy here. I read the Swedish newspaper. I thought, okay, well, it's one place in the world where there's some sanity. Um, and I think it's not just Sweden because the, all the Scandinavian countries sort of have had a fairly similar pos uh, policy with among the lowest uh, amounts of lockdowns, as well as now for two years. Uh, among the lowest COVID mortality and the lowest access mortality. Um, and there was a discussion in Sweden because those who opposed, those who wanted to lock down more, they had some powerful people arguing the case, including academics and uh, uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, the sort of the equivalent of New York Times in Sweden. Uh, but if you go to other European countries, I think in the UK it was very similar in a sense to the US. Um, if you go to uh, like uh, Uganda, I think the schools were closed for two years. Um, so uh, there were many countries who sort of followed the leads of, I think, the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, on I, these I think, matters. And, and if I can add that, that is, I think, uh, that's my perception. There's there's a uh, a massive influence of the Western countries, we cannot underestimate, it's not just that the United States is economically intertwined and therefore if we lock down the US there's a chain reaction and the Western European countries, everyone in the world suffers. When you have the head of the US effort get on TV almost every single day for a year talking about lockdowns, and when you have the United States federal guidance that was lock down businesses, shut schools, restrict, don't see your families, don't see the older people, don't even go into the hospital if you're ill. When you have people like Dr. Fauci, the most visible person on the task force during the previous administration and the head of the whole effort now, and Dr. Burks, who was the task force medical side director, when they get up on stage with the President of the United States or next to the President, and they put that out there, and it's on TV and in the newspapers all over. These other countries don't just say, we're going to do what we want. I, 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 don't, I think that's sort of not the way it works. I may be overstating the influence of the United States, but I don't think so. 
they still quote what Dr. Fauci is saying in these other countries. And given that the statistical modelers that uh, Martin can talk about a lot better than I can, uh, in the UK started this whole thing, really, and in the US, and they were so wrong, their models were proven wrong, grossly wrong, making false assumptions. But those things were put on for some reason on TV, and there was just a, uh, a herd mentality. And the influence of the United States public health leadership, in my view, is to blame for what happened in the rest of the world to some extent. We were told at my university that we couldn't come to work uh, to do our research because if it was non-essential. Nobody likes to hear that their work is non-essential. So I, I converted my lab to a SARS-CoV-2 wastewater covalent, uh, surveillance. And for the past year and a half, I've generated troves of data on, on virus transmission using w wastewater. And one of the things that I've realized is that you, know, you could plot these data and superimpose when mask mandates are put in or fines or whatever those things and get a really amazing picture of how effective those policies are using wastewater. And so I'm wondering if you are, uh, if anybody's doing this on a bigger scale. Like I've been doing it for my community for San Luis Obispo. I can, and, I, and I'm, you know, I've gotten in trouble for saying some of the things that I have but it's grounded in science, it's in, 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 and it's grounded in poop, <laughs> and, 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 and the, transmi the transmission data that I'm seeing. And I'm just wondering if you've, if you've um, seen anybody, if anybody's doing this, this kind of work, looking at wastewater and correlating trends in wastewater uh, virus loads to certain so, you know, interventions that have been used. So there was a new, recent New York Times story, I don't know if you saw, uh, the, the, where the CDC admitted to hiding data, hiding information. One of the things that they admitted to, to not really revealing is, was their wastewater surveillance. Um, I mean, they, they <laughs> the idea that, the, that the, a premier uh, public health agency in the United States is like hiding data, it, I just, I can't wrap my mind around this, right? Like, the, the, we, bas we basically are owed transparency by this. Your work and the work of others who are l tracking the, 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 the uh, the, the, the spread of the virus efficiently, they didn't, I mean, has gotten no attention because I think, again, it's the same thing. They wanted to create this illusion of consensus, this illusion of they are control of the science. Anyone who's on the outside, well, you don't, you're just on the fringe. Um, and I think, uh, if, think of, just imagine how much better we would have done if we'd had all our minds, all the minds of people contributing to this discussion in the, in the normal way. Like, we would have had a lot more fights, but it would have, we would have ended up in a much better place, I think. Uh, no, oh, sorry, he's, he's next and then. There's a microphone there. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so we worked on a little paper very early on uh, looking at whether the IHME model was calibrated. And so we were the ones that said, you know, the 95% confident intervals control, you know, cover the next day. 20% of the time, that was us. <laughs> so we sent it to a journal, and of course, you know, we're not gonna, we're sorry to tell you, but we're not publishing it, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, in the middle of the paragraph was, uh, we don't want people to be complacent. So you can, you know, parse that uh, however you wanna parse it. And then they kept going. So it was like this non sequitur sentence right in the middle right in the middle of the, of the thing. I, I don't know to this day, it, every day I think about that sentence, but it seems like these journals were really uh, guardians, they thought themselves as guardians of the universe, and basically yeah. that's... Can that's I ask, were you Gates funded? What? You, were you Gates funded? Oh yeah, yeah, he gave them $400 million. Okay. Yeah, he <laughs> gave that place for it. You can't argue, see the journals can't yeah, argue uh, with so, that. I mean, yeah. uh, like, so there's a, there's a couple of things there. Like one, one is that um, uh, it, it, early in the pandemic, actually even now, there was this, cons this idea that if you came out with a result that, that underplayed the, the lethality of the virus, that you were gonna cause people to act irresponsibly. Uh, Neil Ferguson, the, the, the guy who did the Imperial College model, famously gave a, 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 uh, an interview where he said that, that uh, it, it, it was fine if he got it wrong in the right direction. 
if you overpredict it. The irresponsible thing is to get it wrong in the, in the, in the, the wrong direction, underpredicting. But in fact, the, the, when the World Health Organization said in the early days of the pandemic that the death rate from the virus is three or four percent, they're talking about the case fatality rate. It's a very misleading number versus what, what your real true risk is if you are exposed to the virus. And as Martin said, it, there's a thousand fold difference by age. The, if, if, if we, are, you, are you underplaying the virus? If you tell people truly, if you're young, you're low, your risk of dying is low. I, I just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a use of science to control people, the behavior of people, that has no place in scientific discussion. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I, I would love to see your story written up and told because yeah. that is, that's, it's absolutely shocking, right? Well, it's not shocking to me because I remember you sent me your paper and you said this is back in, I think, spring, summer 2020, April, and uh, you said, I can't get this paper published. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, an example of the internal, sort of there's two types of censorship going on here. One is by science itself, the journals, the universities, the NIH, the powerful people. And then there's another type, which is the media. And the media is the pathway, of course, the interface between the public and the science journals. Regular people are not going to look up the science publication. So the media is so critical. And when you have an interface that is the filter and the, uh, is somehow the imprimatur of scientific truth uh, telling Martin Koldorf that you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about about the vaccines, uh, we're in a very dangerous place. And so this is one of the things we're going to try to do with peer review here. There's, a, there's a, uh, a need to get more rapid publication with accountable peer review or less obstructive peer review. Uh, and we, and you know, it, so w the solutions are not obvious, but we know the problems are very, very profound and we need to fix them. Just one more point in that kind of vein. Uh, when I'm very grouchy in the morning, I think, uh, is there any way we could audit the journals? I mean, let's take, you know, a journal and let's look at the papers on COVID that were accepted and let's look at the papers that were rejected and let's check and let's get the comments between the editors, um, you know, about the, about the papers. You know, that, that would really, uh, I think, that's kind of a Johnny Unitas kind of uh, a project, but, uh, uh, you know, that's something... Uh, you know. Who's, who's over here? Yeah. Aaron, if we got you next. You mentioned you were at the White House in October 2020, and I'm wondering if you can shed some light on, on why it was that President uh, Trump and maybe his advisors didn't have any of you people advising him instead of Dr. Fauci. Well, uh, you know, I was called, uh, I detailed this in my book, I don't want to bore everyone with all the details, but uh, at the end of July, and asked if I would help the president. And so I said, yes, okay, because there is no other answer, it's my country. Uh, when I got there, I was shocked at what I saw because the people on the task force on the medical side were incompetent, didn't know the data, and concerned about self-protection and threatened when I would walk into a meeting with 12 or 15 scientific publications and go through a little mini soliloquy of the data and they had nothing except you're an outlier, they would say. And they would go to the media. And what happened, the, the question is what happened uh, really why? There was a, somehow we diverged into a country where we have, our leaders have abrogated their responsibility to lead by saying, oh, that's the CDC guidance. That's what Fauci and Burke say. They were given the authority as opposed to just being there advising and letting the people in charge have the authority. And so now we have somehow a CDC that is taken as a, a law issuer a rule issuer. That's not what the CDC ever was intended to be. It gives guidance, that's it. Uh, but that's not the current situation. The second point I wanna make is, I did view myself as an advisor that was needed to bring in the experts who knew what they were talking about and they were actually doing the research. 
And so I set up a meeting and brought in Martin Koldorf, Jay Bhattacharya, Joe Ladapo, uh, and others, people from Stanford and Harvard and UCLA and uh, Tufts University. Uh, and we met with the president. And the people on the task force specifically, that meeting was scheduled so Dr. Burks could attend. Dr. Burks withdrew from the meeting right before it, it happened. Didn't want to have the discussion with people doing the research. That's not the mark of a scientist. Okay, science is the debate. Science is being able to know the material enough so that you win on the basis of knowing more. And if you don't know more, your opinion doesn't carry the day. And so we met with President Trump. And the next day we met with the five of us, of the people, met with Vice President Pence. And then later I brought in Dr. Gupta Bhattacharya and Kaldorf to meet with Secretary Azar because Secretary Azar wanted to hear answers to his questions. And so we did the best we could, but the bottom line was the authority over the federal guidance to the pandemic was given to doctors Fauci, Burks, and Redfield. And today that continues because it is given, as you've heard our current president say many times, whatever the CDC says, whatever Dr. Fauci says. And that is the uh, really gross uh, malfeasance of leadership, in my opinion. So this will actually be the final question, uh, Dr. Cariad. Yeah. So as a, as a follow up to that, I, I think this problem of the relationship between science and political authority is a very, very difficult one. All of the solutions seem to be in a sort of all or nothing extreme direction. And I've thought a lot about, okay, what, what created that? And it seems to me that the political authorities are going to anoint some scientist or group of scientists to be, you know, in the current climate, the, the experts that we're going to listen to. And unfortunately, you've, Dr. Atlas, you just named the ones that were anointed, and we all know sort of the results of that. But I think one of the challenges is that the answer to most scientific questions is nuanced, right? The Great Barrington Declaration is, is nuanced in the sense of, is COVID, you know, bad? Well, it depends. Are vaccines good or bad? Are they helpful or unhelpful? Well, it depends. It depends on your age group, your risk categories. All, all of these nuance, nuances, which, um, you know, at the, at the journal club, at the medical school, we discuss and, and get down into the weeds on. Politicians don't really seem interested in that. They want something for the stump speech. They want an answer. And especially early on in the pandemic, when the media was focused on COVID case counts and COVID death counts, and state-by-state state comparisons. There seemed to be this kind of mimetic rivalry between governors to do more and more extreme measures. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seen as doing more to address COVID if my lockdowns or, you know, my policies are sort of more extreme. And so but my question has to do with how can the nuances of science actually interact with the more binary or all or nothing sort of policy tendencies that you know people who are looking to get reelected or or the media i mean i think this has to do with the media as well right they you, you get 60 seconds to do a sound bite and it's hard to it's hard to get a lot of nuance in that context how do scientists interact with those systems without compromising what yeah. we should be good at, which is subtlety. Well, it, I think, take, uh, go ahead. Uh, I think public health and public health scientists have no choice but to trust the public uh, if he wants to be trusted. It has to trust the public by honestly say what we know, by honestly say what we don't know, uh, uh, both of those things. Because what's happening is that public health CDC says something which then turns out to be wrong. Nobody's going to trust CDC then. So the only, the only <coughs> way forward is to be honest, even those things that we don't know about. And it also requires courageous leaders. Okay, we do have people in this country who looked at the data and made a decision that used logic. 
I mean, I could point to several of them. One that everybody talks about is Governor DeSantis. We all had, I had conversations with Governor DeSantis since the spring of 2020. Um, we've all appeared on panels and had many conversations. This is a person who makes it his business to know the data and then to make a common sense assessment of what needs to be done. And he's been proven right. Okay, he did better than a lot of states, most states that did the lockdowns, and better than my own state of California on a data-driven analysis. And so you need people who are not afraid. And, uh, you know, I once wrote a book uh, in my pre-health policy life called Magnetic Resonance Imaging of the Brain and Spine. And I never, I, I always thought there's, there are people who don't really have a brain, but I never knew how few people had a spine. <laughs> Aaron, can I, can I address one, one, one thing I thought you, were, you said is quite important? Uh, you, you have to have scientific advice. Like, if you're a leader, you, 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 just, you just have to. Like, you, you can't expect political leaders to all have read the scientific literature. That's not realistic. Um, the key thing is that the scientific advisors, they cannot be in a position to silence the rest of the scientific community so that they themselves are seen as the science. Like you cannot have a scientific advisor who goes around saying, thinking that if you challenge me, you're not simply challenging a man, you're challenging science itself. Right? That, 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 is, uh, uh, that, that is, I think that, that hubris has been a, a key part of the failed response to COVID in the United States and elsewhere. So. Is there a selection bias toward those who are sort of more all or nothing or nuance because that's what some of the politicians want. Like if you bring your hands too much and say, well, on one hand or on the other hand, they're not going to call you again. Do you, do you know what I mean? Well, you know, Scott, Scott has a very good way of distil distilling scientific nuance into a compelling way of, you can hear him when he, when he speaks, right? There's a reason why presidents speak, speak with him. I think there's a skill to that, but Scott is also open to, to reading the literature and I, I will we'll have scientific you see you know scientific arguments. Well, I mean, as, fun, to be right? to be honest, I, I called these guys and Johnny and Edie's every day to every other day for nine months straight, uh, and so uh, because you need to you need to hear people's opinions. We all can read. We've all reviewed papers. We've all reviewed grants. We've all submitted these things, uh, but you need to hear what people think and bounce things off of people. That is what is the, the essence of really coming up with the right answer. I think Martin said something very important too. Uh, the information is needed not just for the public and to trust the public, and that is, but it's also needed because that's why I brought in a bunch of other people to talk to the president. The presidents, these politicians, they need to hear it. They need to get enough uh, divergent op opinion so that they can be critical thinkers because it's their responsibility. And so uh, I, I think that, they, again, it, it all boils down to the lack of censorship, the transparency of information, and that, that really is the sort of most obvious solution to most of these things. So, okay. I guess a uh, final 30-second uh, thought from each panelist, starting with Martin, and then we'll finish. Oh, Dr. Koldorf, pardon me. Uh, uh, well, thank you all for coming here and for listening. And I think the role or the task of uh, restoring trust and restoring uh, in public health and science is something that we all share. So I hope that's something that we can all do together, uh, both everybody here as well as many people around this country and around this world. We have to do this together. Yeah, I'll sort of echo what Martin said. I want to thank everyone for understanding the seriousness and the, the really the urgency of the problem here, the country and the world. Uh, was harmed significantly, uh, and uh, we can't let that happen again. And so I'm very delighted that so many people accepted our invitation to come here also for our event tomorrow. Uh, I must say that there are still people who said they support us, but they wouldn't come tomorrow. They're afraid. So this is a problem that is very serious. There's no quick solution, but it's going to take 
everybody's effort and more and more people to have some uh, sort of commitment and courage and eventually with a wide sort of population basis of getting something good accomplished, we will do it because it will not come from top down. All these things, these changes have to come from bottom up people. So uh, I just want to thank each of you that's come. From many of you I've learned during the pandemic. I've, I've read some of your papers. I've, I've, uh, uh, frankly, you give me hope that scientific discussion, science is still alive. Uh, and I've doubted that sometimes. Uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, I think in order for science to, to have, uh, to revive, to be what it really should be, it, it's, it's in badly need of a reformation, right? A, a, a reestablishment of, uh, of, of uh, the, the norms of the enlightenment that uh, to me has it's darkened during the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, this, this effort, you, you all that are in the room, are, I, I, I know will be a big part of that reform and reestablishment of science as a force for good in this world. Well, and let's uh, give them all a hand of applause. Thank you.